Okay, um, just as an introduction before we start reading this story, um, this takes place in the early 60s, I believe, um, when they were uh, integrating the school system and confronting the, um, the, the, the evil, the, really the, the, the racist fear of so many uh, whites in all over the country, really, and um, there is some, there is some very, th th this uh, short story gives you a snapshot of, of some of that, so it is incredibly dark and uh, um, pretty, pretty upsetting, but it's full of a, a, a ton of, of, of really, it's, it's one of the best short stories I've ever read, it's, it's really got so much going on, and uh, um, yeah, so I, ho I hope you enjoy. Again, this is The Secret Integration by Thomas Pynchon. Outside, it was raining. The first rain of October, end of haying season, end of the fall's brilliance, purity of light, a certain soundness to weather that had brought New Yorkers flooding up through the Berkshires not too many weekends ago to see the trees changing in that sun. Today, by contrast, it was Saturday and raining. A lousy combination. Inside at the moment was Tim Santora, waiting for 10 o'clock and wondering how he was going to get out past his mother. Grover wanted to see him at 10 this morning, so he had to go. He sat curled in an old washing machine that lay on its side in a back room of the house. He listened to rain going down a drain pipe and looked at a wart that was on his finger. The word had been there for two weeks and wasn't going to go away. The other day, his mother had taken him over to Dr. Slothrop, who painted some red stuff on it, turned out the lights, and said, Now, when I switch on my magic purple lamp, watch what happens to the wart. It wasn't a very magic-looking lamp, but when the doctor turned it on, the wart glowed a bright green. Ah, good, said Dr. Slothrop. Green. That means the wart will go away, Tim. It hasn't got a chance. But as they were going out, the doctor said to Tim's mother in a lowered voice, Tim had learned how to listen in on, suggestion therapy works about half the time. If this doesn't clear up now, spontaneously, bring him back and we'll try liquid nitrogen. Soon as he got home, Tim ran over to Grover. Tim ran over to ask Grover what suggestion therapy meant. He found him down in the cellar, working on another invention. Grover Snod was a little older than Tim, and a boy genius, within limits anyway. A boy genius with flaws. His inventions, for example, didn't always work. And last year, he'd had this racket, doing everybody's homework for them, at a dime an assignment. But he'd given himself away too often. They knew somehow, they had a curve, according to Grover, that told them how well everybody was supposed to do that it was him behind all the 90s and 100s kids started getting. You can't fight the law of averages, Grover said. You can't fight the curve. So they went to work earnestly on his parents to talk them into transferring him. Some place, any place, expert though he might be on every school topic from in, ig, igneous rocks to Indian raids. Grover was still too dumb, as Tim saw it, to cover up how smart he was. Whenever he had a chance to show it, he'd always weaken. In a problem like somebody's yard, a triangle, find the area, Grover couldn't resist bringing in a little trigonometry, which half the class couldn't even pronounce, or calculus, a word they saw from time to time in the outer space comics, and was only a word. But Tim and others were tolerant about it. Why shouldn't Grover show off? He had a hard time sometimes. It wasn't any use talking to people his own age about higher mathematics or higher anything else. He used to discuss foreign policy with his father, Grover confided to him, until one night they had a serious division over view of views over Berlin. I know what they ought to do, Grover yelled. He always yelled at walls at something else solid that happened to be around, to let you know it wasn't you he was mad at, but something else. 
something to do with the scaled up world adults made, remade and lived in without him. Some inertia and stubbornness, he was too small except inside himself to overcome. Exactly what they should do, but when Tim asked what Grover only said, never mind. The thing we argued about isn't important, but now we don't talk. That is important. When I'm home now, they let me alone and I let them alone. This year, he was only home on weekends and Wednesdays. Other days, he commuted 20 miles to college, a Berkshire men's college patterned on Williams but smaller. On take courses and talk to people about higher everything. The public school had won, had banished him. They didn't have time for him and wanted everybody doing their own homework. It was apparently okay with Grover's father too because of that estrangement over Berlin. It wasn't that he, it isn't that he's stupid or mean, Grover yelled at his family's oil burner. He isn't, it's worse than that. He understands things that I don't care about and I care about things he does, he'll never understand. I don't get it, said Tim. Hey, Grover, what's suggestion therapy mean? Like faith healing, said Grover. That how they're trying to get rid of that wart? Yeah. He told about the red stuff that glowed green and the lamp. Ultraviolet fluorescence, Grover said, having obvious fun with the words, has no effect on the wart. They're trying to talk it away. But I just messed that up for them. And he started laughing, rolling around on the floor of the cellar as if somebody was tickling him. It won't work. When it wants to go away, it will. That's all. Warts have a mind of their own. It tickled Grover any time he could interfere with the scheming of grown-ups. It never occurred to Tim to want to figure out why it was so. Grover himself cared only slightly about his own motives. They think I'm smarter than I am, he hazarded once. They have this idea about a boy genius, I think. What one is supposed to be, you know? They see him on television or something, and that's what they want me to be like. He'd been very mad that day, Tim remembered, because a new invention hadn't worked out, a sodium grenade. Two compartments, sodium and water, separated by a burst diaphragm. When the sodium came in contact with the water, it would go off with a tremendous bang, but the diaphragm was too strong or something, and it wouldn't break. To make things worse, Grover had been reading Tom Swift and His Wizard Camera by Victor Appleton. He kept coming across these Tom Swift books by apparent accident, though he had developed the theory lately that it was by design, that the books were coming across him, and that his parents and or the school were deeply involved. Tom Swift books were a direct affront to him, as if he were expected to compete to build even better inventions and make even more money on them and invest it more wisely than Tom Swift. I hate Tom Swift, he yelled. Quit reading those books then, Tim suggested, but Grover couldn't. He tried, but he couldn't stop. Every time one of them popped up, as if from an invisible malevolent toaster, he'd devour it. It was an addiction. He was haunted by aerial warships, electric rifles. It's awful, he said. The guy's a show off. He talks funny and he's a snob and hitting his head to remember the word a racist. A what? You know this colored servant Tom Swift has? Remember, named Eradicate Samson, Rad for short? The way he treats that guy, it's disgusting. Do they want me to read that stuff so I'll be like that? Maybe that's how, said Tim, excited, having figured it out all at once, how they want you to be with Carl. He meant Carl Barrington a colored kid they knew. His family had moved here from Pittsfield not so long ago. The Barringtons lived in Northumberland Estates, a new development out across an abandoned quarry and a couple of rye fields from the oldest part of Mingeboro that Grover and Tim lived in. Like them and the, Et like them and Etienne Sherlu, Carl was a nut for practical jokes, not just watching and laughing, but for actually playing them and thinking up new ones. This being one reason the four of them hung around together. 
the suggestion that Rad, a character in a book, had anything to do with Carl, puzzled Grover. Don't they like Carl, or what, he said. I don't think it's him. It's his mother and father. What did they do? Tim made a don't ask me face. Pittsfield is a city, he said. I guess you can do almost anything in a city. Maybe they ran a numbers game. You got that from watching television, Grover accused. And Tim said, yeah, and laughed. Grover said, does your mother know that you and me and Carl go out, you know, fool around? I didn't tell her, Tim said. She didn't say not to. Don't tell her, said Grover. Tim didn't. It wasn't that Grover ever gave orders, but there was an understanding among all of them that even though sometimes he was wrong about things, he still knew more than any of the rest of them, and they ought to listen to him. If he told you that a wart wasn't going to go away, that it had a mind of its own, all the purple lights and green fluorescents in Massachusetts would not prevail, the wart would stay. Tim looked at the wart, a little leery about it, as if it did have a separate intelligence. If he'd been a few years younger, he would have given the wart a name, but he was beginning to realize only little kids named things. Now he sat inside the washing machine he'd used last year for a space capsule, listened to the rain, began to think of getting old, and then older, and older without bound. Cut the thought off before it modulated to the matter of dying, decided to ask Grover today if he'd learned anything new about the other things, the liquid nitrogen. Nitrogen is a gas, Grover had told him. I never heard of it being a liquid. That was all. But he might have something today. You never knew what he was going to come back from college with. Once he'd brought a multicolored model of a protein molecule, which was now in the hideout, along with the Japanese TV and the sodium stockpile, a bunch of old transmission parts from Adian Sherlew's father's junkyard, concrete bust of Alf London, stolen in one of the weekly raids on Minchboro Park, busted Mize van der Roche chair, salvaged from another of the old estates, not to mention assorted chandelier, pa chandelier pieces, fragments of tapestries, fragments of tapestries, teak newels, one fur overcoat they could hang around the neck of the bust and hide under sometimes like in a tent. Tim rolled out of the machine and went as quietly as he could into the kitchen to check the clock. It was a little past 10. Grover was never on time himself but he always wanted other people to be. Punctuality, he would declaim, rolling the word at you like an invisible puree is not one of your salient virtues. All you had to say to him was, huh? And he'd forget it and get down to business. One of the reasons Tim liked him. Tim's mother wasn't in the living room. The television was off and at first he thought she might've gone out. He pulled his raincoat down off the hanger in the hall closet and started for the back door. Then he heard her dialing. He came around a corner, and there she was under the black stairs, holding the blue princess telephone between her jaw and shoulder. She'd been dialing with one hand and holding the other in front of her in a tight, pale fist. There was a look on her face Tim had never seen before. A little, what do you call it? Nervous? Scared? He didn't know. If she saw him there, she gave no sign. Though he'd made noise enough, the receiver stopped buzzing and somebody answered. You niggers, his mother spat out suddenly. Dirty niggers, get out of this town. Go back to Pittsfield. Get out before you get in real trouble. Then she hung up fast. The hand that was in a fist had been shaking and now her other hand, once it let go of the receiver, started shaking a little too. She turned swiftly, as if she'd smelled him like a deer. Caught Tim looking at her in astonishment. Oh, you, she said, beginning to smile, except for her eyes. What are you doing, Tim said, which wasn't what he'd meant to ask. Oh, playing a joke, Tim, she said, a practical joke. Tim shrugged and went out the back door. I'm going out, he told her, without looking back. He knew she wouldn't give him any trouble now about it, because he'd caught her. 
He ran out into the rain and passed two wet lilac bushes down a slope into long grass turned to hay. His sneakers soaked after only a couple three steps. Grover Snod's house, an older one than Tim's with a gambrel roof, edged out from behind a big maple to greet him. When he'd been younger, Tim used to think of the house as a person and say hello to it each time he came over, as if it actually were peeking around the maple at him, friendly, in a kind of game between friends. He still was not at the point where he could give up this, where he could give this up completely. It would be cruel to the house to stop believing in it. So, hi house, he said as usual. The house had a face on the end, a pleasant old face, windows for eyes and nose, a face that always seemed to be smiling. Tim ran out by it. Tim ran out by it. Just a moment, only a, only a shadow, dwarfed against the towering, benevolent face. The rain was coming down pretty hard. He skidded around a corner and up to another maple with pieces of board nailed to the side of the trunk, up slipping once and out a long limb to Grover's window. Whistling electronic sounds came from inside. Grovey, Tim said, banging out the window. Hey! Grover opened the window and announced to Tim that he had a lamentable tendency to dilatoriousness. What? said Tim. I just heard a kid from I just heard a kid in New York, Grover told him, as Tim climbed into the room. There's something funny with the sky today because, you know, I have trouble most of the time just getting Springfield. Grover w Grover was a radio ham. He put together his own transceiver rigs and test equipment. Not only the sky, but these mountains too, made incoming incoming signals capricious. Grover's room, certain nights when Tim stayed over, filled as the hour grew late with disembodied voices, sometimes even from as far away as the sea. Grover liked to listen, but he seldom transmitted to anybody. He had road maps stuck up on the wall, and each time he heard a new voice, he'd mark it on the map, along with the frequency. Tim had never seen him sleep. He'd still be up no matter what time Tim turned in, fooling with dials, pressing a huge pair of rubber earphones to his head. There was a speaker too. Sometimes he had that on. Drifting in and out of sleep, Tim would hear, mixed with dreams, cops being called to investigate car wrecks or just noises or shadows that moved where everything should have been still. Cabbies out to meet the night's trains of grouching. Cabbies out to meet the night's trains and grouching mostly about coffee or cracking dry jokes with their dispatcher. Some half of a chess game tugs across the Dutch hills, taking a string of gravel barges down the Hudson. Road workers in the autumn and winter working late, getting out snow fence or plowing. A merchantman at sea. Now and then when the thing in the sky, the heavy side layer, was ready for it. All these coming down, filtering through to populate his dreams, so that in the morning he'd never know which had been real, which he'd hallucinated. Grover never was any help. Waking up before he was fully out of his dreams, Tim would say, Grovey, what about the lost raccoon? Cops find him? Or what about that Canadian logger? in the houseboat up the river. And Grover would always answer, I don't remember that. When ADN Shirdloo stayed over too, he'd remember different things than Tim did. Singing or badger watchers, reporting in to some kind of headquarters or bitter arguments half in Italian about pro football. ADN was supposed to be here today too. It was a regular Saturday morning briefing session. Probably his father had kept him late again, working over at the junkyard. He was a very fat kid who wrote his name 80N, usually on telephone poles with ha-ha after it, in Cran. 
yellow keel swipe from road crews. Like Tim and Grover and Carl, ADN loved to play practical jokes, only with him, it was an obsession. Grover was a genius. Tim wanted some but someday to become a basketball coach. Carl might star on one of his teams. But ADN, all he could see was a career somehow playing jokes. That's crazy, kids would tell him. A career? You mean a comedian or something on TV? A clown? What? And ADN, putting his arm around your shoulders, which if you were alert enough, you realized he was doing not out of friendship, but to scotch tape a sign to you reading, my mother wears combat boots or kick here with an arrow, would tell you, my father says everything's going to be machines when we grow up. He says the only jobs open will be in junkyards for busted machines. The only thing a machine can't do is play jokes. That's all they'll use people for is jokes. Okay, just want to stop there for now. Right now, we're about I don't know, probably a third, maybe halfway into the story. So, hope you're enjoying it so far. We'll pick up there next time.